I'm Julie Ratner, the host of Breast Friends here in LTV, this beautiful studio. And today, my breast friend and guest is Kate Snyder Jones. And Kate is the LMSW at the Phillips Family Cancer Center, where her responsibilities are patient care at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital and um, also care management at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital and the Phillips Family Cancer Center. Kate, hello, welcome for coming. Thank you for being with us today. Of course. Thank you, Julie, for it, having me. It's it's wonderful. So for our audience, the truth is I've known Kate for a number of ye number of years. I've been on some of her journey. And so I have a question for you. What prompted you to take on the challenge of graduate school? <laughs> sort of at a later point in life <laughs> and to take on all that homework, writing papers, studying for tests, and to go to social work school. What was that all about? Well, um, I had gone through cancer myself and um, realized that there was this this void in, in the medical world that, that people are just sort of scrambling when they get cancer. They don't know who to talk to. We don't have an oncologist in our back pocket. Um, and then e emotionally, you're just so distraught as you go through the disease that um, I just felt like this was something I needed to do to help other people, that they didn't go through um, cancer the way I did, which was very lonely. Um, Can I ask you to talk mm -hmm. more about that? Because I think my sister had a similar experience. You were diagnosed and told you had cancer, and then what happened? Or did I, nothing happen? I just remember being in a doctor's office, coincidentally, and um, getting this call and saying to the doctor, I need to take it, and the receptionist said, you've got cancer. And just looking at this doctor and him just saying, well, I'm really sorry, and have a good day. And walking outside and... Oh, you're, God, you're just, like sucker punched, right? Yeah. I, it was just like the most amazing news in, in a horrible way. Um, and I was, I was afraid I was going to die, you know, as, as is everyone who hears that. Um, and so I just started asking people. I was living in New York City at the time. I was just asking anybody, who do I go to? Which doctors? You know, how does this work? Like, what's the first thing that I'm supposed to do? And it's terrible. It was awful. There's no safety net. There's no guidance. No. Nope. You know, my sister Ellen had a similar experience. She was at Lenox Hill. So I do name the hospital because I fault them for not treating her well. Mm -hmm. They basically woke her up from a biopsy, said, you have breast cancer. Here's your token and good luck you know, for the subway, and, and, and good luck. And when I spoke to her, she said she couldn't even get the words out, I have breast cancer. And I, I remember thinking, like, who is, has a baby and has breast cancer? And then I thought, we have to help her. And, you know, I thought, I'm a librarian. I know how to do research. I'll work on this. But she needed to have had more than a sister with good intentions. Well... Thank goodness that she had you because, you know, there are people out there that have absolutely nobody, even if they have a family. Um, the family has not been through this before. Right. So they don't even know where to look. There's, there are no gold guideposts. There's no little yellow brick road to follow. There's nothing. Right. And there's no one to hold your hand and tell you that you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask you, you went back to school yes. and put yourself through this rigorous experience. How long was the master's program? Uh, it was two years. I, I do remember getting a research paper um, the month before school started and reading it and not comprehending one word and closing the book and just crying. Oh my, because it's a whole new language. Oh. And you don't need... I had no idea. Right. I was just like, I can't do this. I've sent my money in. I can't do this. But you have to because you sent your money in. And <laughs> right. every language comes with... Its, every discipline, I should say, comes with its own language. You know, I was just um, listening to the Supreme Court on my way over here. Mm -hmm. And I realized they talk in a different way than we speak. 
You know, it's just, it's just interesting. And medicine has its own language. My background's in education. There is its own language. So this, like, yeah, jargon. It was. It really it, is. It was really tough. But, you know, as the months went on and, and I made one mistake after another, but it just became more of a habit and, and, and more comprehension came with it. So Absolutely. So, yeah. I think... It's an interesting experience to go back to school as an older learner mm -hmm. and not like 18 when we started college. What was that like for you to go back as, as a, an adult learner? Um, well, I was not the oldest person in my class. There were, I was the third eldest, but um, I was in class with peers my daughter's age and younger. Um, so not only was it different in that regard, you know, just having had life experience and, uh, and the 20 year olds had not had as much as me, but, um, I, I, I'm grateful that I was able to go to school with kids, my daughter's age, because I, I learned about her generation and what she's going through. So it was a real eye opener in that regard. I agree because it may. I think it changes how we parent our kids because we see it differently. Mm -hmm. I had a similar experience when I went back to school because I was in graduate school at Teachers College and my kids were both in college and we sort of study around the kitchen table. <laughs> but I was learning about college student development, which was just what my girls were, and it was so. I think it made me a better mother to have been there. I agree. Um, there was also, you know, the whole pronouns that we did not, I did not grow up with, and all right. of a sudden we're having to deal with all the pronouns and talking to each other in, in a different way, and I, I made one mistake after another, I will admit to it, and, and the students were even like, oh, well, here comes Kate, like, what is she going to do today? They loved but, you, I bet, because you, they could relate to you. In your program, did you have internships, you know, as part like or practicums as part of your your yes schedule? Um, my first one was in child welfare. Um, I traveled an hour and a half to um, a facility in Queens um, early in the morning, and then you know at the end of the day, um, it was a really sad situation to 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 have that internship. It it taught me a lot. Um, and I came to appreciate um, the struggles that, that these families are having. Um, and then after that, I worked at New York Presbyterian Hospital in the oncology department. Um, so basically preparing me for what I'm doing now. Was that what influenced you or when you went back, you definitely had a plan in a way when you went back to graduate school that you would sort of focus on oncology? Yes, yes, that was definitely my, my goal all along, um, since I'd had breast cancer, I wanted to work with other patients that were going through the same um, diagnosis that I'd had. Uh, but then this job came up at the Phillips Family Cancer Center, so I work with um, patients that are dealing with all types of cancer. There is some, not similarity, but there are some challenges that probably, regardless of the type of cancer you have, affect everyone, I would assume, whether it's relationships, job, fear, pain. C can you yes. speak to that? Or and what some of the biggest challenges are that you see at Phillips Family Cancer Center? Um, well, I think that the important thing to uh, realize when you go through cancer is that it is a family disease. You, you know, one person is, is going through the treatment, but that affects everybody under that roof, sure. including the animals. Oh, that's a thought. Um, yeah. I'm it, not an it, animal person, so yeah. can you, because um, you have to walk the dog or feed the cat? Yes, but also, more? like, I noticed with my dog, he wanted to be in bed with me every day when I was recovering with his face, like, on my chest. And he'd never done that before. You know, he would get he would get in my bed and he would watch TV. But wait, wait, what do you think that's so about? Do you think he sensed something? I think he did. I really think he did. And then when my mother uh, was going through cancer, I'd actually um, purchased a new new dog, and 
he would not leave her side either. Oh, it's not even a stuffed animal. Isn't that interesting? So um, I'd like to, everyone to know it's a family disease up front. Your roles are gonna change as you go through this treatment. Like you're used to taking the garbage out. You're not gonna be doing it anymore. And then when treatment's over, the roles have to shift back or they shift in a different way again. So um, I'm always telling people open communication is, the, is key. Asking for help is key. People can't read your mind. They don't know what you need. They don't know what you want. Um, even if it's a spouse that you've had around for 40 years. So you re there really is a need. You, you support the patient, but you really need support for the whole family. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, this is a pun, but it's a real pun. Who cares for the caregiver? It was like, who cares? And then, who cares? Yeah, yeah. Because the caregiver is at risk also. Absolutely. Is, Absolutely. is there a program at Phillips Family Cancer Center that's sort of for family therapy or that works with the whole families? Um, well, um, I'm the only social worker there, although we are in um, uh, partnership with Fighting Chance, who has licensed right. therapists as well. So. What I do is I meet with the patients individually. I'll meet with them and their spouses or their children and try to figure out what the issue is of the day because it's constantly changing as you go through treatment. Um, and then I may end up just talking to the spouse on the phone or just talking to uh, a teenage girl who is showing disruptive behavior at school. Um, and it all comes back to the fact that her mom's going through treatment and she's scared and she's acting out in this way. Um, so, um, so much pressure on kids and everyone. I mean, you think about it for the teenage girl, being a teenage girl's pressure itself, right? And then you have a sick mom and the family's in disarray. Right. It's not right. a very safe feeling. And, and, you know, the thought of a mother having to have a double mastectomy while her daughter is going through puberty. You know, it's like, there's a scary. lot going on here. Terrifying. And, and, and frightening for the child, you know, especially at that age, you know, where, right. where the world is changing so quickly. Um, I suspect every age. When I think about my sister Ellen, because Leora was six months old when Ellen was diagnosed, mm -hmm. and she was six years old when Ellen died, and there was always someone taking care of her. It was a gift that my family, I think, gave, and we were smart enough to realize it, that this child had to feel, feel safe all the time. And she never had to worry about what happens to me because mommy's in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was a scary time. I think every time must be so fraught. Yes because she was just learning to trust people or, her, or needing her mommy mm. as a little girl mm. and not having it. But there were others who sort of pitched in, but still wasn't her mother. Right, right. And it's, you know, the day before Ellen died, um, Hugo, my brother-in-law, brought, brought Leora to the hospital and they took her into the room and Ellen was pretty much um, non-communicative. And she was in the room for, I would say, less than two seconds when she came out crying and said, I'm not going back in there till mommy talks to me. And it was sweet. Sweet and hard. Sad. Oh. Yeah. No. Yeah. Lucky for Phillips Family Cancer Center that they have you there. Oh, and what do you, you do over at, at at the breast center? Do you do you spend time there at all? Um, well, I am always open for anyone that needs any kind of counseling. So if they call me from the cancer center, from the breast cancer center, and they say, you know, we need somebody who needs some issues or to talk about some issues, I certainly can run over there. Um, I'll talk to people on the telephone. I'll get calls out of the blue from uh, people anywhere in the country. Um, How does that happen? I don't know. I mean, that they I get do. your name, or they know about the program. I I think just word of mouth, and um, so I'll I'll talk to people as often as they need to, to work through issues. Do you think that the program at Phillips Family Cancer Center and having a social worker on board who reaches out and talks and does counseling, is sort of state of the art, or is it more unusual that this exists? Um, it is becoming more common, but it is still a, a very unique situation um, to have a social worker in the facility 
to talk to people while they're going through chemotherapy or if they're having a bad day at home and they just need to, to reach out, to laugh, to cry, to scream, I'm there for them. And, um, you know, sometimes you just, you just need to talk to somebody. And you've been, you've been calling your girlfriends, you've been calling, you know, your family members. You just need a, a, another person to, to vent or to just listen to what's going on. So Ellen said to me once, and this is to the people calling, you know, to patients calling you, because Ellen and I could finish each other's sentences. We were extremely close. You know, growing up, she was, because she's so much younger than, she was so much younger than I am. She was like my little mascot. I was the older sister who could do no wrong. So, of course, I always loved her, you know, unconditionally, because she loved me unconditionally. It was very, um, it was quite special. Um, and she was saying to me once, as close as we are, you don't get it because you haven't walked in these shoes. And so she, I think, preferred to talk to some of the women who were in her support group. I was the person she called at two in the morning when she couldn't sleep, and that was great. But I think issues that she had about her body, about being married, about probably sex, all that stuff that's so important and intimate and critical to a relationship, she felt, or having a young child, she talked to her support group peers about. And I suspect that's why people would call you, because you've been there. And that, ex mm -hmm. how does that experience affect you, well, affect how you talk to people? Because you can bring a veracity and a truth. I might talk to someone and try to be kind and caring and empathetic. Not the same. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just saw... Um this play appropriate on oh, Broadway. Oh, I heard about it. What is it? Um, it? It's adult children. They lose their their father is the last um, parent alive, and he dies. And it's really the conflict that happens. And um, I remember so well when my parents passed with cancer, and the anger and the fear and the sadness that comes up and the way that the siblings are talking to each other, I could very much relate to this play. So I think that that's really where I come from when I work with my patients. Is that I know what it's like to be the daughter of somebody who dies of cancer. I know what it's like to be a mother trying to protect a young daughter who's got cancer. I know what it's like to um, be the caretaker for elderly parents who have got cancer. Um, so I think with my experience, um, I'm able to put myself into the shoes of a lot of my patients and their family members. Um, so in a way, I'm lucky. And it yeah. makes you very effective, you know, to be able to talk from a place of having been in the trenches, I think is really important. And isn't it fascinating when something like this happens, at least in my family, we all sort of revert to our childhood roles. <laughs> and that, and that um, <laughs> awful sibling relationship, some of the, what was the worst between us, like comes out immediately. Yes. Yes. You know, it's like, wow. It is, it's crazy making. Um, and also, the patient changes daily throughout their treatment or throughout the demise, you know. And so, as a family member, you have to change as well. Or as a caretaker, you have to constantly be going, okay, now what's happening today? And how is it affecting me? How do I not take this personally because he or she is not the same person. You can't hold them to the same standards. Right. Someone called me once towards the end of Ellen's life and said, I have been calling your sister and she's not calling me back. And I said, she's not going to call you back because she can't. Mm -hmm. And I sort of had to, and it's, it's amazing how we have to shift the lens through which we see this person and sort of get thicker skin so that we don't take it personally because they're not at fault. And it's, it's, it's sort of a hard thing if you're not initiated into that. And so you have, you have a lot of hats to wear. I do. I do. And also, you know, the, the, the medication that the patient is under can change them.
you know, the steroids, like lack of sleep, like all of these things can affect the personality of the patient. There are so many factors, right, that you have to, it's like a juggler, you have to keep all these balls in the air. There are so many factors towards this. Yeah, yeah. We could talk for hours, and weeks and months about what goes on. So um, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> in your frantic, busy life, what is a day like at the, when you, Phil's Family Cancer Center, you get there at the crack of dawn or almost the crack of dawn, and, and so you park your car, <laughs> walk in the door, what next? Clock in, first thing. <laughs> you clock? Yes, we clock in. Wow, okay. Oh, clock out. Um, no, what I do is um, I go through the schedule for the day, I see which patients are coming in, I read all their charts, I make sure I know what's happened um, since they last came in, I make sure that um, uh, the notes are up, up to date and um, try to figure out like where that patient is gonna be today when they walk in. Like, did they just get a CAT scan? Or are they about to get a CAT scan? Okay, that makes Which, a lot of an anxiety level is yes. off the charts when that happens. Yes. Um, you know, have they changed medication since I last saw them? Ha have they had any personal issues that have gone on? So I try to to absorb all that before the patients come in. And then I meet, I try to meet with each patient as they're getting infusions, even if it's just a matter of just checking in to see how they're doing and assess for any needs that are, are, are required. You know, some people have transportation issues, some people have nutrition issues. Sometimes a patient will tell me something that they don't tell the doctor. So then I have to go meet with the medical team and I'll be like, I just want you to know that they're complaining that, that they've got a funny sensation in their mouth and they haven't reported that to the doctor. Well, that could be the start of mouth sores. And so I'll help the doctor right. in that regard. Um, somebody could be coming back from a vacation, you know, and you never know what's happened on that vacation, but um, they, they may look healthy, they may have a, a beautiful tan, but in fact, they've been struggling during their, their time abroad or whatever. So I just try to be up to date on everything. I meet with the patients. I, I ask lots of questions. I'm assuming you have a very hectic day because there's a lot of patients that you see mm -hmm. and it's not much time and that you sort of grab a bite of a sandwich or a piece of fruit on your way from one to the other. Yep, that's, that's exactly right. So the days are very full, and does, do they? Do, do you take the day home with you, or are you able to separate? Um, in the beginning, I really had a tough time because these these people are opening up to me in a way that they may not be even opening up to their spouses, and I'm learning about very personal issues. Right, you're holding a lot, and um, so in the beginning, and I say the beginning, I mean it, it took years for for me to be able to to sort of separate myself when I got, get home. But there certainly have been th those patients that get under your skin and, and they stay with you forever. I want to stop on that note because we have only a few seconds left. Okay. And I want to say, so that you can tell the audience, if you know, someone's listening, they want your services at Phillips Family Cancer Center. Your name is Kate Snyder Jones. Yes. And what is your phone number if someone would like to reach out to you? 631-638-7777. Um, Thank you. We have about a second left. Kate, thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you. You are my best friend and my good friend and a gift to this community. Oh, thank thank you. you for being here. Thank you so much for having me here today.